Stuart Charity. I'm the Executive Director of the Australian Automotive Aftermarket Association. Independent repair and service businesses right across Australia are facing a number of serious challenges at the moment, including the technological advancement of, of vehicles, the uh, skills and training gaps, and also the predatory behaviour of the car companies. For these reasons, we believe the time is right to form a truly national group uh, that exclusively represents the interests of independent repairers around the country. And we've done that by forming a group called the Automotive Repair Council of Australia, or ARCA. The main activities of ARCA are to uh, protect consumer choice and competition in the vehicle repair and service market uh, by um, ensuring that we have mandated access to uh, dealer level repair and service information and to really uh, put the spotlight on some of the anti-competitive behaviour of the car companies, including their cap price and free service programs and also uh, warranty confusion and misinformation. One of the activities that we'll be doing is leveraging our relationship with parts suppliers so that we can um, uh, deliver technical and training nights uh, around the country. And we've also got a number of initiatives in place uh, to, to start to address the skills gaps in the industry. One of the benefits will be uh, that we'll be doing research to uh, help identify initiatives that uh, can be implemented in ARCA members' businesses. Uh, to help them improve their, their profitability and business performance. Well, if you're a progressive repairer that cares about the future of our industry, then you need to join ARCA, and together uh, we'll make sure that there's a bright future for everyone in our industry. Okay, uh, who has been in the sessions earlier today? Hey, and I've been facilitating all of them, you came back. That's good, that's good, that's good. My name's Colin Bachman, for those that have, haven't been in the sessions before, and my role is to facilitate these. This is a very easy session, this one, because I'm simply going to introduce this person, this person's going to present, we have a little bit of communication at the end, and that's it. Some of the others have had two and three combo-style presentations. To set the scene, you just saw that video on ARCA, which is the Automobile, sorry, the Automotive Repair Council of Australia, and that's a separate section within AAA to help try and fight what we're talking about today, and that is the issue of OE. Now, it's like I don't see it as them and us, but that's the way they see it. So they set the rules, so that's the way it's going to be. The reality is that we have an enormous problem looming right now. We have the technology issues, we have the access of data, and we have all of the skullduggery that's going on. Look, if I was a big manufacturer like these guys and I had big deep pockets, I'd probably do the same thing. It's just a go-to-market strategy. And they do make the jolly things, but they're making it harder. How many of you work on Bimmers? Okay. Uh, Rovers, Jaguars. You realise, of course, now there's no such thing as a logbook. You can't get access to it. You can't even find out. You, your customer can't even get access to it. It's their jolly car. Now, we, we'll change that. People like, like Leslie, that I'm about to introduce you, will go and fight to change it. We shouldn't have to fight, but that's the world we live in. However, today is about you understanding where we're at, understanding the parameters that we're working with. I guess the rules of the sand pit, which are made by the manufacturers making their vehicles the way they are with the technology in them and doing things that they say they go to market strategies with lots and lots of scare tactics. In other words, if you don't have it serviced this way, you won't have this or that won't be available. All of those sort of things are there. Your customers are going to start to be aware of this. What today's session about is about is to make you aware of what's happening so you can start to think of what are the things you're going to say to your customers that are polite, sensible, rational, valid, to re-educate them. That we as aftermarket are a force to be reckoned with and we are there to provide them with a value for money service. Just like for those who you were at the session before where I mentioned the guy with the 8.6 has it serviced, 138, 138, 138, time to, it's over, goes to the dealer, says, how much? 480. He goes, what the heck? Goes to aftermarket, nice son. Goes to aftermarket, says 380. He says, how come? Now, you can stand there and say to him, well, mate, it's pretty simple. It's been 138 all this time because the manufacturer took some money out of the price when you paid, bought the car, put it in their back pocket and they fed it back to the dealer as a subsidy so, they could, so you thought you were getting a cheap service. You can't say that. You'd like to. Oh, you do. <laughs> 
So we've got to just understand that's how it is, all right? Now, what's happening now is Leslie is going to give you, who's the relations, uh, government relations manager for AAA, is going to give you the reality of where it's at. I've put a bit of fun on it, a bit of spin on it, and talked a little bit from those aspects. So to set the scene for how important it is for you to listen to what we're about to have. So please work, make, welcome Leslie Hayes. Thank you very much, Colin. Um, I do want to say a very sincere thank you to all of you for being here today. Not only because it's kind of disappointing to speak to an empty room, but more importantly, it is a sign of how committed you all are to the choice of repair a cause that you take some time to come here, to learn about where we're up to in the campaign, to hopefully have some time to share some experience and I think just by being in the room, you show your preparedness to work together to protect the future of our industry and more importantly, to protect consumers' right to a choice of repairer. Just sitting here today is a sign that you are committed to the cause. I have to say that the single defining thing about our industry is that even though there are many independent repairers in the room, we are capable of all working together for a common cause we do have a shared experience. We are all experiencing many of the same problems. And I've got some interesting data to show you about just how common the experiences are. So if you're thinking this is happening to you, you know it's happening to others, you're damn right it is. And I'm going to show you just the extent of it and what it costs your business. But I am delighted to have you here because advocacy on behalf of this industry relies upon a group of people who care about the issue, who are prepared to be vocal about the issue, and who are prepared to support their business, support their customers' right to choose, and support the future of our industry. So thank you for being here. Let's begin. So many of you will be aware of the Choice of Repairer campaign. In fact, just so that I can check in to see who we have, um, tell me who is aware of Choice of Repairer. Wave at me. Excellent. Tell me if you were here in 2015 when Stuart Charity gave you an update. Okay, quite a few, good. Because I'm going to kind of gloss over some of the early stages of the campaign. I, I won't go back too far. I won't go, I'll go a little bit far back, not all the way back to 2009. I'll gloss over it a bit because what I want to do is talk about where we are today and what the future might look like without spending too much time going over all the machinations. Now, I know you're probably all incredibly interested in the deep detail of every single government inquiry, every member of parliament we've ever spoken to, but try and save your excitement and I'll cut to the chase as soon as I can. Now, competition is important for any industry. And we know that because we are fiercely competitive, even though we're all sitting alongside of each other. When you give customers choice, when there is competition in the marketplace, free, open, transparent competition, we are all the better for it. Competition brings sharpness of price. We've got to compete on a good price point. We've got to compete with a different quality service. We've got to specialise in different brands, focus on a geographic area, be a good country repairer, be a European repairer, but competition is good. That's the environment that we, that we operate in. We don't force anyone to use our services. We do not say to anyone, you have no choice. You must use my repair business. Now, as much as that would be nice for the bank balance, it's not good for sustainability. And bad things happen to any industry that tries to restrict choice. And we often talk about the technological disruption, but in fact, most disruptions are disruptions of choice. When consumers have not had a choice, and they suddenly have a choice, they will punish you. As soon as they have an opportunity to go somewhere else, they'll find someone else who delivers a solution to their problem. Because we frequently forget that we're not actually selling a product or a service, we're selling a solution to a problem. You're selling a reliability, safety, you're selling resale value of the vehicle, you're saving people money because if the car is regularly serviced, there won't be large repair bills in the future. No one really wants to get their car ma maintained, serviced and repaired, but they do want the outcomes of it. That's the service that we're selling. And competition reminds us that the consumer is making a choice and they're looking for a particular outcome. The service is just a means to an end. 
And we've got a really big industry. It's a $16 billion industry. And we should not be surprised at the level of competition. It's fierce. And as Colin said, if you were a big multinational car company, you too might use any, any tactic you can to get the lion's share of that market. Whether it's lawful, not lawful, moral, ethical, anything you can to say to consumers, actually I'm the only game in town and you've got to use me for all the parts, all the service, and you've got to keep coming back. So what I want to talk about today is what's going on today, how it affects our owners about where they get vehicles serviced, I want to talk about what we're doing about it, what the government's doing about it. I'm openly asking you whether you think that's enough. And I want to talk about what the future might look like under both scenarios. What's the future for our industry? This is a really interesting demand curve, isn't it? So you know this anyway. The blue line is the dealership service. So consumers choosing to get their vehicles serviced at a dealership is the blue, and the grey is, is us. Now, it's a pretty weird demand curve, you've got to admit that, don't you? All of a sudden, after four years, almost to the dot, four and a half, some say five and a half, the jury's out on that. I've seen some dealer information, which fell off the back of the truck, of course, uh, which said it was actually four and a half. It's interesting, because our advice is it's, it's pushing out to five and a half. So I think it depends on which car brand you're frequenting. But all of a sudden, at about five years, every single vehicle owner decides they're better off in, in our sector. I'm always, I'm always incredibly impressed at the 4% at year one, aren't you? As we'll talk about it in a moment, but, but you know the pressure that a new car owner has. You know your customers have told you what the dealer told them when they bought the car. Those 4%, they're a gutsy group, aren't they? They are totally determined to use the repairer of their choice. You've built a relationship with them which is pretty unbreakable, I'd say. And you must be wondering, where's the others? It's 83% and 4%. Where's everyone else? Um, who buys a new car and doesn't get it serviced? I, I don't know. There, are, there is some internal servicing for fleets. There are some large fleet operates that run their own internal servicing departments. So I think they might be there. But look what happens at this five-year mark. And we would say, as economists, no demand curve looks like this. Something else is going on. And we'll talk about what's going on. Now, the data about what is going on in our industry, and we think we're being pushed out a little more and more with extended warranties and cap price servicing, and I'll talk about how important they are and what they're doing. But the data is pretty interesting, because it looks like dealers are picking up you know, 2 to 3% year on, year on, year on. Every year, they, they get 2%, 3% more of the market. Interestingly enough, we're getting about 1% more of the market every year. So we're growing too. So where's it coming from? Fortunately for all of us, it's actually coming from the underserviced vehicles. So you know this, the number of people who don't get their cars serviced at all, it's just an accident waiting to bloody happen. These are the people who bring their car into you after three or four years of no servicing and go, why, why is the repair bill so much? I'm a good driver, I don't understand it. What do you mean $1,200? Um, so the, the actual growth is in people under-servicing their vehicles. There's a little bit of a drop-off in DIY. Not much. Not much. You might think, well, that's all right. I'll take all the cars over five years of age. They can all go to the dealers. After that, can come to me. They need some serious work when they're five years old, don't they? 100,000 K, 120,000 on the clock, they'll start working. Well, the data that we have is that the gap between five years under five years and over five years is narrowing. So the car park isn't necessarily getting any younger, and you would have heard this over the last couple of days, our car park's about 10 years old, nine and a half, 10 and a half, depends who you ask. The car park's not getting any younger. We're selling a million year vehicles a year. There are some 13 million passenger vehicles on the road. It takes a while for those brand new vehicles to lower the age of the car park. What's happening is it is a bit distorted because people with 25 year old cars are hanging on to them. Now that tends to distort that picture a bit. There's a bit more retirement in the sort of eight to 11 year. So I could show you that graph, but I would, I'd bore you shitless, so I won't. So what is important to consumers? If our consumers had free choice in the market, if they were told the truth about logbook servicing, but if they had an access to their own logbook, if they had freedom to choose their repairer, these are the things that are important to them. And we know that because some, some advanced economies on our planet actually allow choosers, they allow their consumers to choose who repairs their vehicle. So in America in particular, where there is open and free choice because the vehicle manufacturers are required under law 
to share service and repair information with the independent repair sector, we can see what it is that's important to our consumers. And so let's have a look at what our independent, independent repair shop consumers say. So it's a well-known fact that if you do a survey, you know how much the dealers survey down to a granular level. They know the sort of coffee to put in the latte machine, how much to buff those tiles in the waiting room. They know everything down to the last minute of check-in and check-out. But if we ask our customers, these are the things that are important. I mean, price, I mean, you thought, God, I gave up an hour for this seminar and price is important. But price is important, yes, but so is the explanation. You are more likely in an independent repairer to get a detailed explanation of what that price was, either in the phone call to authorise the work or in the pickup. So it was a little bit more expensive because we had to use a car branded water pump or it took us a long time to get to the part. So you get a, a full explanation that is very, very important to consumers. I mean, quality is a given. Hopefully, after you've repaired my car, I don't bring it back to you a week later. Courteousness, apparently people don't like standing in the waiting room dinging the bell for 10 minutes. Who knew? <laughs> On time, is it ready? One of the things that independent repairers are well known for, and this has been researched in much more detail in the USA, is forecasting. So consumers love that an independent repairer will say, I've fixed this work for you, I've done this, I've done this, but I do want to tell you that within six months, you're probably going to need this done. You probably do that. Yep, lots of nods in the room, yes. So that is highly valued by customers. It tells me I better get rid of this car quickly. No, that does not true. I should save some money. Um, to uh, get this car fixed in about six months' time. So that, that's what's important to customers when they have choice. They're choosing us, this is why they're choosing us, and our numbers are, are, are quite good. Now what's going on in the Australian market where there are lots of tactics by the vehicle manufacturers to say you must get your car repaired and serviced at the dealer? And I've given you this iceberg as my little analogy. I am a previous teacher, so I like analogy. Now what I want to talk about is the stuff above the waterline is the stuff in, in consumers' heads. So when we go out and talk to consumers and when we talk to repair and service workshops about what the consumers are saying, this is the stuff that consumers are mentioning. Why did you take your car to the dealer? Why do you use the dealer? This is particularly the case where you are servicing the, all of the family's fleet and you find out that one of them's got a new car. You can do my wife's car, but I'm taking my car to the dealer because I have to. Why is that? What's the number one reason? You're allowed to yell. Yeah. Warranty, of course. So that's what's in their heads, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And below the waterline, these are the stuff that is influencing consumers, or maybe not, but it's not something that they would talk about. It's not something that they will mention. Why do you use the dealer? It's the stuff above the waterline, and I want to talk about it. I really want to cover this in some detail, so I might flip through the top ones a bit. Don't wear this T-shirt in your workshop, please. Not a good idea. So we know from experience, I'm not telling you anything, that dealers are very good at giving verbal advice. You won't get it in writing. One of my favorite stories is a, a workshop that said to his customer came back, and can't use my car, service my car. So the dealer says, I have to get it done at the dealer. And the, the workshop owner said, tell you what, go back to the dealer and get him to write that down, and I'll give you 100 bucks. He said that to every customer for two years and paid out nothing. Nothing. So you won't get it in writing. The, the, I'll show you, there's a good study on that as well. There's some concern about dealers' goodwill. Who's from Queensland? If you check the RACQ website, they will say, you may use your independent repairer. However, if you're going to have a warranty claim and you're worried about whether there's a blurry area there about yes or no, it's going to be a warranty or not, if you're getting your vehicle serviced at the dealer, you might have built up some goodwill. Mm touchy, isn't it? Not good. So please suck up to your dealer. Is the, it's not a good way to claim your consumer rights, is it? Yeah, and perhaps you should buy him a slab of beer and look after his children on the weekend. That might help too. Uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but there is a great deal of confusion about what consumer's statutory rights are under law, what the new car warranty is, and what the so-called extended warranty is. Every single consumer has consumer rights under the Australian Consumer Law. They're statutory rights. They override everything. 
The manufacturer may say this is not under my warranty, but it is still under their consumer rights. If it's not fit for purpose, if it's got a fault, if it doesn't do what they said it would do, if the car is faulty, it's a warranty claim. It doesn't matter what the manufacturer's warranty says or doesn't say. One of the things that Choice Magazine did recently was contacted 24 dealers and said, I've just bought a car from you. Apparently those choice people lie. I've just bought a car from you. Can I use my independent repairer because I like them better? And three dealers told an absolute lie. No, you cannot. That's, you'll lose your warranty. Interesting. A number of others were a bit evasive and only told the truth when pushed. Um, some people went, oh yeah, you, you, you can use anyone you like, but not if you have a cap price service or an extended warranty. I'll talk about that in a moment. And many used advisable, recommended and preferred. That's not telling you guys anything because that's what they print in the logbook. A little bit. Use your authorised... It's, it's preferred that that's what you do. And this is why people that we know, clever people, think they have to take their dealer back to... They have to take their car back to the dealer. Smart people who should know better do not know their statutory rights and think that their warranty will be void if they go back to the dealer. Now, I've kind of had enough of this, really. Enough's enough. So we'll be, we're working on a number of levels, one of which is we're talking to government about this whole issue, and I'll talk about that campaign in a moment. But last year we started working by working in the area of giving our workshops the conversation to have with, with their customers. So here's some information you can arm yourself with to have that conversation with your customer. So when a customer says, I have to go back to the dealer, here's some information. Some good FAQs, what do I tell my customer? And as you can see from our stand, if you've been on the expo, we're now working in the area of direct consumer facing. So we've been working to let workshops know how to have that conversation, and now we're talking directly to your customers. You can use your independent repairer for a logbook servicing without voiding a warranty. And all of the ACCC's advice is in here. As long as you use fit-for-purpose parts, they are fitted by qualified staff, it will not affect your warranty. But I think customers want to see it in black and white. I think you guys have wanted to see it in black and white for a long time, and it's here. So the government is extremely concerned about warranties and uh, we participated in a forum not that long ago where the head of the government's primary competition and consumer commission said to the car companies, you are of course telling customers about their statutory rights. And the car company went, oh, only if we have to, do we need to? Oh, no, no, we don't really. We just talk about the new car warranty. Um, that doesn't please a government at all. There is, the law is the law, and it's not something that can be bent and changed for your own purpose. So there is already a current government inquiry that is looking at warranties. There has been a great deal of work on extended warranties and expect to see more. I mean, you can't even go to a JB Hi-Fi now, buy a piece of audio equipment that doesn't have an extended warranty, and you would know that governments are concerned about all of those extended warranties. They do not provide customers with anything more or their potential to offer more than you currently have under law. If the product is faulty, you have a claim, full stop. You don't need to buy a policy off of them. Um, I mentioned that we've got some point of sale brochures. We're also working with our members that have a warranty claim. So let's say that one of our members has a consumer come in, you put an aftermarket filter in, all of a sudden the dealer says, I'm not honouring a warranty claim, something to do with the brakes, uh, the transmission, you go, oh, I can see a filter here, I can see a sticker that you saw an independent repairer. We're providing legal advice to our members to support the customer and our workshop. So we'll back our judgment that we're not going to avoid the warranty by having your car serviced by an independent repairer. So we're trying to work on, on three levels. Working directly with consumers, working with our members, working with government. I think the other thing that's important here though is that independent repairers have a role too. You've got a role too. Our, our surveys show us that you are a very trusted and respected advisor, and people respect your opinion. And many of our workshops are actually saying to the consumer, you've got a warranty claim here. Are you uncomfortable having that conversation with the dealer? Because I'll have it for you. How many people drive the car to the dealer? Is anyone? Yeah. Good. Yep. I'm not going to let my customer drive it to the dealer. That's so clever. I'll drive it. I'll bring it back. Thanks very much. It's nice to see how many of the workshops get the follow-up letter from the dealer going, how'd you enjoy my service? I hope you give them a one, do you? 
I thought it was crap, the coffee was rubbish. <laughs> yes. So having that conversation is highly valued. People don't like, one of the reasons they're taking out these extended warranties is people don't like conflict. They're frightened to have that conversation and who wouldn't? It's me against Holden. You know, those people are slick. I don't know anything about the thing in me. What's it that might have caused the thing in me, Bobby? I don't know whether it's a warranty claim or not. You do. And having that conversation is highly valued. Imagine saying to a customer, you look worried, I'll do it for you. Give us your keys. Cap price servicing. I'd love not to say this, that cap price, I'd love to say cap price servicing is having no effect on our market. Because the problem with the term cap price servicing is none of those words are actually correct. It's not a cap price, and sometimes it's not even a service. Who's had cars that have come into them after a cap price service? Yep, yeah. Any of them with cr the filters haven't been changed? Yep, yep. So what's happening is they're getting an essential service. So, oh, we, sorry, we didn't mean logbook servicing. We meant we just have a look at it. One guy went to have a look and stood in the waiting room having a coffee. It took 45 seconds for his car to be serviced. I challenge any of you to beat that one. 45 seconds. There you go, mate. Here's your keys. I'm still drinking my coffee. I finished my free latte. Um, but it is having an effect. One in ten people who go to the dealer say it's because of a cap price service. This is a disgrace because we've worked very hard on this and so has the ACCC. And we're going to be doing some more work on it. We've produced a, a brochure as well. So again, we need to be talking to our customers. Um, we took action, well, the ACCC took action, but we were the ones who complained. So we had our lawyers trawl over the Kia cap price service offer, and it was same price for the lifetime of the car. What? I just feel so comforted, don't you? I'm always going to pay $260 to not have my car serviced. Thanks. I'll take that deal. Um, well, they kept changing the price. Cap price service, $260. Oh, sorry, I meant $280. Sorry, I meant $320. It's capped. I thought this was a cap price. Yeah, it's capped at 320. And because they kept varying it, the, we, we wrote a nicely worded lawyer's letter to the ACCC and they took action against Kia. Unfortunately, it just told them off. But they did make Kia write to all of their customers and there was some repatriation of the Kia's customers' funds. They did call in all the other car companies and say, please don't be naughty, don't do that again, that's not very nice. If you do a cap price service check now, you'll find out some of them starting to call it fixed price or in reality, this is a 30-day quote. That's all it is. That's what they're selling. But four days after they took Kia to task, Holden announced their lifetime cap price servicing for every car forever. Again, except it's not lifetime capped. It's not for every car, and it's not forever. <laughs> There's nothing true about that whole statement. Um, but there are things that we can do. We can talk to our customers. You must have customers who buy new cars and ask you their, ask your advice. I'm going to buy a car, what shall I buy? Yep, lots of nods. Say to them, when they say to you, this is the price, and you go, no, you could do better than that, mate, you go, they'll, they'll chuck in a cap price service. Tell them where to stick that. Don't take the cap price service, because that's actually going to cost you money, and it's going, to, it's going to harm your vehicle. So you don't want the extended warranty, you don't want the cap price, you want a decent price on the car sale. Drive it down. Don't take all the rubbish add-ons because they're going to cost you and they're going to stop you choosing. You will be stuck taking your car back to the dealer. You're going to be drinking crappy lattes and watching your car serviced in 45 seconds. Welcome to car ownership. And our cap price servicing brochure. Look, we're going to keep going. We, we, we monitor their websites all the time. We catch them in the act. We'll be back to the ACCC. Extended warranties. You, you'll see a lot of activity on extended warranties. Government authorities are now printing everywhere that extended warranties are not worth the paper they're written on. They may not give you anything extra. There is a current inquiry, and I'll talk about that in a moment, that's looking at extended warranties. In some other countries, I think particularly in Europe, this has got so bad that they're not only, you know, we've got a cooling off period of 30 days, so you sign an extended warranty and you can cancel it in 30 days. They're now talking about an opt-in process. So you've got no warranty unless you take all the paperwork home for 30 days, have a read, and then say, yes, please, I want it. Because the other problem we know is that when you're buying a car, there's a lot of pressure, there's a lot of schmoozing, sign here, sign here, sign here, sign here. Um, not to mention the 80% commission they're about to charge you on a car loan. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, 
So we need to be making sure that we talk to our consumers. We need to say to them, when they say I'm getting a free extended warranty, say, no, you're not, mate. No such thing as a free lunch. You're about to pay for that extended warranty. You're about to pay with choice. So that was the above the line. Recalls, well, you've got to go back for that. But again, lots of our, lots of our repairers are driving the car there for the recall. That's if we know about them. Thanks for telling us. Apparently, they're a state secret. Uh, cap price, extended and warranty, they're the things that people will talk to you about. These are the things that they won't talk to you about. I want to start with the biggest one in the room, which is access to service and repair information. Uh, many people have been involved in this campaign for some time. So let's make sure we're all clear about what we're talking about. When we started talking about this, we said we want access to codes. And the car companies went, there's only two codes, the radio and the key. And we went, don't be cute. You're just being obtuse now. This is what we mean when we talk about service and repair information. These are the things that we're advocating for. We want access to this information, dealer level information, on a fee for service basis. I can get this information if I'm in Europe, I can get it if I'm in America, because it's the law. But I can't get it in Australia. This is the stuff that we're campaigning for. Have a look at this. This is Mitsubishi Europe. So one of our members logged on to this only last week. This is a repairer's dream. This is kind of the nirvana. You can't read this, but it says, hello, trusted independent repairer. What would you like? Vehicle identification, handbooks, diagnosis, wiring diagrams, trouble codes, software calibration. Uh, what, what can we give you? How can we help you? We'd love to give you everything that we've got and everything we give our dealers. Please sign here, give us your credit card. I, don't, I was going to put the Mitsubishi Australia website up, but it's just stupid. It just, I think I can make the point without doing it. It's kind of an FAQ, frequently asked questions. And so consumers click there, and the first frequently asked question is, where should I get my car serviced? And apparently you should get it done at the dealership. So that was a surprise to me. Um, certainly none of this. So we, we used this recently to show the Competition and Consumer Commission just what we're talking about. We're not talking about the radio code. Sometimes you just be too cute for your own good, I think. This is what we're talking about. We want dealer level information. So I'm not going to take you on the full choice of repairer journey so far. I, I fear that you will give up the will to live. So I'm not going to do all of this. And I know that many of you have been on this journey. So I want you just to pop your hand up if you have already hosted an MP visit to your workshop, written to the ACCC, participated in some lobbying. Warrigal, you can put your hand up. Queenslanders, keep your hand up. Have a look around, guys. These are the troublemakers. These are the agitators. These are the people who say, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. Uh, I've got, I'm, a, I'm a constituent. I know who my local MP is, and I'm going to use the power that I have. Also, I see thousands of consumers through my workshop, and it might just be a really interesting day when I decide to clip a how to vote ticket to the invoice. So we've been on this journey for some time. Now, I'm going to talk probably about the point at which he signed the voluntary agreement. So, you know, lots of stuff happened. Um, the government said, you know what, this just cannot go on. Independent repairers are entitled to access to repair and service information, and it's critical to consumer choice, and it's critical to competition. Fair prices. So you guys need to get together in a room and work out an agreement. And we went, yes. Stuart Charity said, I cannot wait to sit in a room with the car companies for 14 months to hammer out an agreement because we get on like a house on fire. In fact, I might just move in with them. Um, so after 14 months, we cobbled together a voluntary agreement which said, the car companies said, Holden, Ford, Toyota, all of those entities that belong to the Federal Chamber of Automotive Industries said, yep, you can have dealer level information and they put their signature on it. 12 months later, one car company. We went, no worries, we're happy with that. At this rate, we'll have free and open competition in our industry in 68 years. No worries. So surprisingly, we said, uh, we're not that patient. And in uh, July 2016, we went to Canberra and lobbied every single political party because there was a federal election on. It's a good time to get an MP's attention when it's an election on. All of a sudden, they're keen to see you. And we said, what's your policy on access to automotive repair and service information. What's your policy? By the way, this is how many independent repairers you have in your electorate, and this is your margin. 
just, just saying. And they all, every single political party said, we'd been doing a lot of work with them before, that they supported sharing of repair and service information. Importantly, the coalition said not only did they support it, but they would do an immediate review into the voluntary agreement and find out why it wasn't working, and they would put a mandatory solution on the table. Excellent. Election was had, coalition got elected, we went back there, and the minister said, yes, I'm going to do this, and the issue was referred to the ACCC. So the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission currently has a brief to investigate the issue. I bet you're all cheering, going, yes, another review. Well done, AAA. <laughs> You've got a government review. I mean, if you could trade in government reviews, we'd be a very wealthy organisation. But I don't want you to be, don't feel depressed about this because we're actually delighted. A lot of entities have had a look at this and they've done a half assed job at it. The ACCC is probably the hardest body to fool. These are the people who know how to follow the money. They're not going to buy any kind of bullshit. There's only two codes. They're asking all the right questions. We're actually quite chuffed. And there are some people here in the audience who have actually had a visit from the ACCC to their workshop. They've opened up the bonnet and they have shown the ACCC what they can and can't do. So we're actually quite optimistic. And it's quite a broad-reaching review. There's a review into consumer guarantees, into false, misleading and deceptive practices in performance, fuel efficiency, fuel consumption and emissions. That's a long clause that means Volkswagen. <laughs> Effect on competition and consumer of post-sale care arrangements such as servicing, that means extended warranties. And finally, us, access to data. And I can tell you that a lot of time is being spent on access to data. So these people actually are not taking any bullshit. They're listening. They're asking all the right questions. They've already been out to workshops. They've already met with members. And they're asking for more and more evidence. Show me, tell me, which models, which, what's going on? We've written, <laughs> I've written a telephone book. So these are the submissions that we've sent to the ACCC. So we're leaving no stone unturned. We've done a full review of the voluntary agreement. What went wrong? Why didn't it work? No monitoring, no measurement, no enforcement. Case closed. Uh, we've provided evidence. Well, as I said, it's a telephone book. I think you should know what the car companies are saying in response because effectively it's what's our job is to go back to government and say, I know you're hearing this rubbish, but let me tell you the answer. But I, I thought you might want to know these for sheer entertainment value. Um, the car industry says, this is the peak body representing the vehicle manufacturers, all of the vehicle manufacturers that are in Australia's car park today, they say, there isn't a problem here. If you want it, you can find it. It's not looking hard enough. I like to check down the back of the couch. Stuff falls down there. Have a look. Um, cars are being repaired, so there isn't a problem. That's a good argument, isn't it? If you walk out onto Clarendon Street, you'll see cars. So someone's repairing them. It's a good argument. The voluntary agreement just means more time. As I said, 67 more years. Uh, things have improved. No, they haven't. Um, ah, this is probably their most favourite, is repairers are not investing in tools and equipment. So apparently you should buy a computer, guys, and maybe a scan tool or two. Oh, you've already done that. You've got a wall of scan tools. Oh, sorry. Um, so one of the things that we do whenever we bring a member of parliament or the ACCC out to a workshop is we say to the workshop owner, I know Warrigal's been through this, show them your scan tools. So we do. We go, here's my scan tools. I don't think they bureaucrats know what it is, but it looks impressive. <laughs> We always go, how much do you spend on this, Brendan? How much do you spend on that? Oh, 25,000. I go, beauty. Um, the dealers say, we, we're entitled to a return on our investment. No, you're not. No, you're not. No one's entitled to a return on investment. Last time I checked the Charter of Human Rights, it wasn't in there. You're entitled to a return on investment if you make good investment decisions. The customer doesn't have to pay for that. So... What we try to do differently this time, and I have to say, I think one of the reasons that we've struggled is we struggle with evidence. And the car companies are, despite their crazy infantile arguments, they're a very powerful group. They had a lot of money, had a lot of money invested in this market. Dealerships do invest a lot of money. Those, those coffee machines don't come cheap, you know. So we've got a lot of people up against us, and when we go through the, the, the corridors of Parliament House, there's it's just me and Stuart crossing crossing the houses, there are 20 of them. They're very powerful, they've got a lot of money. Their government relations departments kill us hands down. So we've got to do a lot of work to get up to their level. So we think the answer this time was to give other regulators some good, hard evidence. So we went out to the market, 
We surveyed 325 of our automotive repairers and we asked them what's going on and we got it done by an independent, so it wasn't us. So we asked them a lot of things, I won't show you all the slides, but one of the things we wanted to test was, remember that it's got better in the last 12 months? You've noticed that, haven't you? The data's just flowing. They're overloaded with data. Um, we always said, how's it going? Has it got better? Has it got smaller? Is it, oh yeah, 4% said it's got, a little, it's got smaller or a little smaller. 4%. Um, is it an important issue, not an important issue? Well, 80% say it's moderate, serious or critical. So it's getting better. That's, the, that's not a particularly good assessment. Um, we asked people what you're having difficulty with. It's not going to be a surprise to anybody in the audience, is it? Anyone surprised? No? We asked people what happens. Now I have to, in terms of volume, if you're seeing 50 cars a week, at least five to six of those vehicles have a data problem, are difficult to diagnose, are sitting there idle waiting for information that you don't have, and in a worst case scenario, they are flat top back to the dealer. And we're going to tell one of our customers, that's probably just come from the dealership, that they've got to go back there. And I don't want to use the dealer, that's why I came here. Nope, I've got to send you back there. So of those vehicles, so you've got a vehicle, we're having trouble reading, we don't know what the normal parameters are, the scan tool is saying there's a fault, we don't trust that, we'd like to get some more information, what happens then? Well on average, we will spend an additional five and a half hours labour on that job. You know that, that, that makes sense? Five and a half hours on a car, only to find a piece of information that would have made the job 15 minutes. So we asked in detail, which vehicle, how long did it take, how long should it have taken? If you could have got the info that you got, let's say the, the dealer who normally helps you out wasn't on a lunch break that time and you got that information because we get everything by the back door and by workarounds. If you'd had that information, how long would it have taken? How long did it take you? It took five and a half hours longer. But have a look at this sign over here. How much did you charge the customer? Did you charge the customer? 77% of you said I didn't charge the customer anything. So who wore the five and a half hours? You did. You did. That's one of the reasons that it's hard to give evidence to the ACCC, because we're, not, we're actually not, we're not passing this on to customers. Our customers don't know, because they're not paying for it. We're paying for it. So where are we as of today? So we've got an ACCC review. I have to say that despite the fact that it is another government review, we are, I'm going to say this quietly, we're optimistic. They're asking the right questions. They're deep diving. When they get a bullshit answer from the car industry, they ask another one and another one and another one. In fact, they were asked the direct question, tell me what information you sell into the American market that you don't sell into the Australian and why? Good question. Good question, Mr. Sims, head of the ACCC. Um, so that, that's good. So the quality of the questions is very good. The workshop visits are highly encouraging. We've had a lot of grass, we've got, we're supporting them with a lot of grassroots experience. So they're getting a lot of case studies. This model, this make, this consumer, this problem, and this is what happened. And I have to say they need more of it, but I'll talk about that at the end. So the quality and the volume of the evidence is, is up higher than it's ever been. They've always asked for evidence. When they first did a study way back in 2012, they said there was an absence of evidence. So we're going to give them evidence and then some. Let me talk a little bit about the other campaigns that are designed to encourage consumers to choose the dealership. So you would have seen, who's seen this? The Genuine is Best? Anyone seen the Genuine is Best campaign? What's this woman doing? I mean, has she taken her own wing mirror off? And I don't know what that's going on there, but this is the campaign that the car companies is running. Make no mistake, the Genuine is Best campaign is designed to bring the car to the dealership. That, that's what it's designed to do. And we have seen, anyone see the fake wheel test? Apparently, if you buy cheap fake wheels from China, that would pass no standard, that should not have been imported into Australia in the first place. If you fit them to a Mercedes-Benz, because that's what you do, isn't it? If I had a Mercedes-Benz, I would, I would import cheap Chinese alloy wheels. That'd have been my first thing. I'd go, you know what, those Mercedes-Benz hubcaps, they're rubbish. I want me some cheap Chinese ones. And if you go over a pothole, they crack and smash. Who knew? 
Thank God. Thanks, Holden. That's fabulous. Uh, bonnet, don't buy a fake bonnet, guys. Next time you're in Coles or Woolworths or something, or I don't know, overseas. If you're overseas, someone offers you a fake bonnet and a couple of pirated CDs, buy the, get the pirated CDs, but don't buy the fake bonnet because they're not good, apparently. So every time we get one of these, we are active in the press talking about how that's not a real world. Show us a real world example and we're, we're interested. We're not happy about counterfeit parts. We're very active ourselves in product standards and making sure that parts meet product standards. You should not put any old shit on a vehicle. You should put good quality components on the vehicle. They do not need to be car company branded. And this information is available to all of our members. In fact, it's available if you're a non-member. So all of these brochures are at our stand and you're welcome to pick them up. What we're encouraging people to do mostly is have the conversation. Um, you're, as I said, your trust levels are huge. They're certainly, they're certainly you know, much better than a number of other professions. Now, they're higher than politicians, but that's not saying anything at all. Um, but you are trusted professionals, uh, and you should use the trust that you have to say, actually, there's not two types of parts. There's not genuine and counterfeit. There are a lot of parts. There are parts that the parts makers make both for the car company and for the independent aftermarket. They're just in a different box. There are aftermarket equivalent parts. So it's the same product design, it's just made by a different manufacturer. Many of these parts meet certifications where they are, where there are certifications in existence. We're a long way before we get to counterfeit parts. So, but what's important is that all parts are covered by statutory guarantee. If you fit a part that fails, you've got a claim against the parts maker, and they've got a claim against you. We are also offering um, opportunities, we're also offering legal support. So if you fit a, 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 a non-car company branded filter, someone tries to knock off the warranty for an unrelated matter, we will provide legal assistance to the customer and to our member. Fitting of non-car company branded parts does not void the warranty. Electronic logbooks. I don't want to spend a long time on electronic logbooks because I want to leave some time for some discussion. And I have to say that, by and large, we think the ACCC is all over this. We've had trouble with service, with repair and service information because it's hard to understand. I mean, what do you mean you use a scan tool, you use a fault code? I don't understand that. But logbooks are very easy to understand. Surely I buy the car and I own the logbook. No, you don't. Well, you can't. No, you don't. They have the logbook, they have access to the electronic logbook, we can't update the logbook, but it's very easy to understand. And it's also clearly anti-competitive. The only people who can update the logbook are the authorised dealers. I think the ACCC and any government authority can see that's manifestly anti-competitive. And imagine if that happened with my medical records. Only one particular doctor could update my medical records. I think portability of records is currently understood as, as important. I think we've got a whole argument running in the community about who owns our data, and I think this is clearly my data. I bought the car, I own the logbook, and my repairer of choice can update that logbook. So I'm quite optimistic about that. I think one of the things we should, just as I round out here, I think one of the things that we need to remind ourselves of is that the reason that we're in this position the reason that we are here talking about choice of repairer and talking about all the things that the manufacturers do to ensure that our customers use the dealer, force them to use the dealer rather than exercise their right to a choice, freedom of choice of who will repair their vehicle is all about the business model. Now we know this, don't we? They're making 1.2 to 3% on the sale of a car. All the money is made, foreign dealers, dealers make from servicing, from parts, and from finance and insurance. How many people have been watching the finance scandal? I love that word, scandal, the finance scandal. So commissions of up to 80% on car financing. Don't get a loan from the car dealer. Tell all your customers. Um, this is, the, the, dealer, the dealership business model is being squeezed. We effectively don't have any beef with the dealers. This data and information that we want should come from manufacturers, not from the dealers. They're trying to make a living. We respect that. We appreciate that. We're actually all in the same industry. But we can't see consumers robbed of choice because you're not making any money selling cars. Neither should someone who owns an eight, seven, eight-year-old vehicle pay a premium for getting their car repaired so that people can afford brand new cars at a cheaper price. Or well, your background's like, my family's never, ever owned a new car, ever. So we're in that seven, eight, nine-year-old cars. We need to get our car serviced at a reasonable price. 
And why should we be subsidising the price of new car sales? But the business model is under pressure. It's going to be under increasing pressure. Um, there are a whole lot of inquiries. Even the dealerships would tell you there are some 25 issues they're currently facing that is a threat to the dealership model. Uh, and unfortunately, we're the ones paying for that. Hence the choice of repair campaign. What is important, I think, is that we are striving to get this right as soon as we can for this reason. <laughs> so we know that whilst we're concerned that vehicles, particularly from 2012 onward, are giving us the most amount of grief for diagnosis and repair, what is really of great concern for us is when the car starts talking to the dealer. So very soon, my car is going to tell the dealership that I need new oil, and it will book me in. So we need in the Australian environment, in the Australian consumer regulatory environment, to have already established the principle that the data that the car produces belongs to me. And I will allocate access to that data to whomever I choose, as long as they are qualified. We've got to get it right, because this is next. This is what's coming down the line. What happens when we no longer have an OBD port, when all of the information that the car is generating is, is stored in the cloud? How are you going to get access to the vehicle in order to find out what's going on inside the vehicle? One of the things I wanted to finish up with is that our insights into consumer preference tells us that well-informed customers, the people who know the most about our industry, are more likely to choose independent repairers. Anyone who visits some of the high-end automotive retailers who does do a little bit of DIY, they're actually servicing their car more often and they do it in the independent market. And the more our customers know about their rights and about their options, the more likely they are to be our customers. You are also very well respected and trusted. If you tell a consumer this is what you should be doing or you need to be doing, they are likely to trust you because your trust ratings are very high. We're going to be doing some more focus groups because we want to be talking to consumers about what influences their choice. So whilst we're waiting for the ACCC to bring down a report, and that will happen very soon, I'll talk about that in a moment, we are going to be talking much more to consumers about what matters to them and what's important. Uh, we are encouraging all independent repairers to have conversations with their customers and we're producing the material to help that conversation and we are talking directly to consumers. These, all of these materials are available at the AAAA stand in the middle of the expo. So this is our role and you're welcome to have a conversation with us about how well we're going but we're going to continue our campaign to advocate for fair competition, to support our consumers' right, our customers' right to choose their repairer. We'll refute any bit of misinformation that goes out there every time. We're spending more time in our relationships, particularly with the consumer groups, RACQ, NRMA, RACV, and we'll continue to do that. Most of our emphasis right now is proving to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, who are doing the deep dive into our industry, that we are very helpful and we will help them with any and every inquiry they may have and any piece of information that they may, they may require. We are very quick to provide that to them. So this is what we think about the future. We are always very optimistic about our industry. We represent everything that is great about Australian industry. Small business, family owned, many of our enterprises are based on sheer guts, pers persistence, on determination. We're a great industry. We're a good representation of what you can do when you work hard, when you invest in local businesses and when you look after your customers. We are the people that help Australians take their kids to school, get to work every day, look after elderly parents, go to sporting events. We're the ones that people rely upon in order to have a vehicle that's in working order. It's more than just any old product or service. It's about the freedom to live the life that you choose. It's about our basic mobility. If I don't have a car that's running, there are so many things that I can't do and so many choices that I can no longer make. So we're really optimistic that advocacy for us is, is a good job to be doing. We've already got government's attention, so it's too late now. The government actually knows something's going on and they're not real happy and once they know, they can't unknow. We think that choice of repairer needs to be broad brushed. So we need to be talking to government about changes 
make there a mandatory requirement for all vehicle manufacturers to share data with the independent repair sector. But more than that, we've got to keep having a discussion. So every time we plug a hole and fill a cap price service, they invent some new fangled angled way to put fear and despair into the minds of our, our customers that they don't have a choice. So we need to start having that conversation. I mentioned earlier that the uh, ACCC's review, which is a good deep dive, needs evidence. So I will say to you that if you have good evidence, if you've ever had a case where you remember the make and the model, many of you have already done this, and I'm sorry if I'm preaching it to you again, but if you have any information that you think would be valuable, if you want to say to government, let me show you what's going on here. Let me show you a car that I should have been able to repair in four hours and it took me two days and let me show you why now is the time to do it. So the ACCC will bring down a report to, uh, an interim report in the middle of the year, so we're only a couple of months away from it and they're asking for evidence this week, next week, but that we're really in that sweet spot. They'll bring down a report about the middle of the year. If we get any inkling they're about to do the right thing by us, then we will start running with those interim recommendations immediately. We may go, go straight to Canberra to start saying, now you've got someone else saying what we've been telling you all along. Why don't you do something about it now? Their final report's due at the end of the year. Might not wait that long, but it is imminent. They are the right group and we are optimistic. Uh, but you've got a role to play, both in the conversation you have with your, with your customers, but also in the stuff you give us in order to feed up to the regulators. There hasn't been great evidence. They've sure got some, but God, I'd, I'd hate to die wondering, wouldn't you? If you've got more, give it to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, we've got some questions that have come through, and the first one, Leslie, is... Um, with a person who buys a car and they get the cap price servicing in the price, and therefore they paid for it as part of the care, they might only do a few Ks. So they're actually being screwed a little by paying for something they don't get. Are we concerned about doing anything about that? We well, they, it, they probably got the cap price service deal uh, free of charge, unfortunately. Free of charge. They paid for it somehow. Um, look, the best we can do is encourage our customers to read the fine print, uh, to see whether they can get out of it. There is opt-out, they'll get a 30-day right. cooling-off period. I mean, yeah. enc just encourage all of your consumers when they're buying a new car to talk to you first. Talk yep. to me, I'll tell you the right, I'll tell you the right story. Okay, the, the other thing was, um, uh, this one here is just on the repair forms, you know, getting that information in. Do we have a portal or anything on WAA website where they can, you know, got an issue, put it in? Yes. We do have a portal yes. for that. Yes, we've got a choice of repairer portal, or just send me an email. Send it straight to me. Don't, Send it don't feel so go in and out. Just Send go to info at www.com.au. Just, just write me an email. Just tell me a story. I don't care. Write it on the back of an invoice and scan it in. We'll take anything, guys. <laughs> and it's going to be the truth. Okay. The last question that we've got, and we, it's on time, which is perfect. The last question we've got here is, where are we at from a AAA point of view about... The, what happened in New Zealand with the Jap imports or the imports? Parallel that, imports? Yeah, parallel imports are looking at doing it in Australia. It's been up and down, up and down. Yes. Where are we at with that? At uh, it's still a, a live issue. I mean, I showed you all of those things that are facing the dealerships. They are very, very worried about parallel imports. Uh, I think government is very nervous about making a decision on parallel imports. It's quite a modest change. It's still on the books, so to speak. Uh, I think they probably care a lot more about finance and insurance, extended yeah, warranties, yeah, yeah. and this study. I think they'll push it to the back burner for a little while, Colin. Uh, I wouldn't be putting money on it, but it's not dead. Not dead? Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Would you thank you? <laughs> thank you. Thanks.